word from Matthew chapter 6. We'll be reading verses 1 through 15. This is a portion taken from the Sermon on the Mount, where the Lord Jesus first um, taught on almsgiving and then on prayer, and the third portion was on fasting. We will read the first two portions, 1 through 15 of Matthew 6. Hear God's own word. Take heed that ye do not your alms before men, to be seen of them. Otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father, which seeth in secret, himself shall reward thee openly. And when thou prayest, Thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, or a private room. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, And thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them. For your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. O Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Amen. May God bless the reading of His own word. Forgive us our debts is the theme of our message this morning as we have arrived at Lord's Day 51 as we're going through the Lord's Prayer. We arrive at the petition which is in verse 12 of Matthew 6 and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And of course... This brings us to the blessed theme of forgiveness. And it is so providential that we are at this place um, in, in the Heidelberg Catechism because it's also this morning a sermon that is meant to prepare our hearts for next Lord's Day as we hope to partake of the Lord's Supper. And the theme of forgiveness, uh, even as we've read the form, it reminds us, and you would agree, that it, it's all in keeping with how to be better prepared. We need to understand what forgiveness is. We need to seek after forgiveness. We need to realize we need forgiveness. Um, Forgiveness is a theme in God's Word that runs the risk of not being so well understood just because of how familiar it is to us. And I would imagine basically every single one would be able to say a very basic definition of forgiveness. And when I say basic, it's not meaning that you couldn't give a more, a greater one. I'm saying basic because sometimes that's where we have a problem. 
is in thinking very simply about certain things that are so great and glorious. Not a technical definition, but a very simple one. I would imagine everyone can. That's not always easy to do with, with doctrines that seem very, very profound. The most simple thing, perhaps, would say, be to say that forgiveness is to have sins taken away. Um, many of you may have heard one of those very basic words for forgiveness used in the New Testament, is that especially in Greek, is the idea of carrying it as if you're holding on to something, but then because it's something undesirable, you just take it away. The taking away of sins. But do you understand the profound reality of forgiveness? Even where it stands in terms of the whole doctrinal structure of theology. And this is what we're hoping to do today. Um, we'll be looking at the definition of forgiveness and see where it stands in light of other doctrines. And then we will look at the basis of forgiveness, why forgiveness exists, where it comes from, and how it can happen to you, how you can experience forgiveness and then thirdly, we'll be looking at the importance of forgiveness. And that will be mainly looking at some applications that we derive. And even looking exactly at our, at our very passage that we're considering. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Um, right there, you see an element of an importance, which is calling sin a debt. And, and what does that mean? All of us know debts are very serious depending on how much you owe and to who you owe it. And, and so that immediately shows the importance of forgiveness. It is a debt that is owed to God that we need taken away, carried away. And that's what forgiveness is. It takes care of that debt. So let us first look at the definition of forgiveness um, and even, even as we begin this first point, I do want to read at this time um, Lord's Day 51 itself, found on page 86, as the explanation to the fifth petition in the Lord's Prayer. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And these are the few words, it's really short, page 86, explaining that is, be pleased. So when, when we pray that, we are in essence asking God to be pleased for the sake of Christ's blood, not to impute to us poor sinners our transgressions, nor that depravity which always cleaves to us. That second phrase is very important. Even as we feel this evidence of thy grace in us, that it is our firm resolution for the heart, from the heart to forgive our neighbor. We will touch on almost basically every phrase that is in this um, answer as we go through this sermon. So first, the definition of forgiveness. Um, we, we gave a very basic one. It is to have sins taken away. But where does it stand? See, we need to understand that in, in the family of God's doctrines, when I say this picture in your mind, um, justification, sanctification, glorification, there's predestination, we can talk about all these doctrines. And where you look at forgiveness is under the doctrine of justification. You're even going to have a hard time if you look through some um, theological books, the theme of forgiveness, you, you, you look at the table of context, you won't even find it there. But what you'll find is the word justification. And as you study that doctrine, it deals with forgiveness. And so it helps us understand that forgiveness is not a doctrine that's kind of solitary on its own. All of them, of course, are connected, but they're all very distinct. Sanctification is connected to justification, but they're very distinct. They're not the same thing. And it's important for us to understand then that well, well, forgiveness is inside the doctrine of justification. That's where it happens. Because justification, if you think of an outline, that's the main title. It starts with forgiveness of sins. See, forgiveness is even what explains what justification is. But justification is not only forgiveness. Forgiveness is your sins taken away, and then for justification to be complete, you need Christ's righteousness given to you. 
You need an imputed righteousness that is perfect. And, and that's the full range of justification so that you can be declared righteous and declared not guilty. Because that, if, if I go to justification, I say, let's think of the most basic definition of justification. And this, for boys and girls, this is what should help you. Because it's, in a sense, it's very simple. Think of that judge who is there on, on his desk and with his gavel, that little hammer that he's about to hit. Everything was heard about what that person, who might be a criminal or maybe he's innocent, and after having heard all the witnesses and having decided what is to be taken into consideration, he is about to hit that gavel and he will pronounce either the word guilty or the word innocent. You see, justification would be the judge hitting the gavel and saying, you are innocent. And the reason I put it this way, it's important because justification is exactly that. It's a declaration. It is not necessarily something that happens inside of you. It is something that is declared about you. And it is declared about you, yes, because of something that happens in you. And it begins with forgiveness. God cleanses you of your sins. And He gives you the righteousness of His Son. And so He is able to declare, you are therefore cleansed. You are therefore innocent. You are no longer my enemy. You are reconciled to me. You are at peace with God. You are a friend of God. You are a child of God. And so it's, it's important to understand when we're talking about forgiveness, we're, we're really talking about the beginning, as it were, or a part of justification. Um, listen to what Calvin said. He said, justified by faith is he who excluded from the righteousness of works, not by, by things that you do, grasps the righteousness of Christ through faith and clothed with it appears in God's sight, not as a sinner, but as a righteous man. Therefore, we explain justification simply as the acceptance with which God receives us into His favor as righteous men. And we say that it consists of the remission of sins and the imputation of of Christ's righteousness. See, the remission of sins is the forgiveness. The imputation of Christ's righteousness is, is the, the, the conclusion of justification. Um, and I, I can also read one other quote I found from Williamus Abrakel. He said, Justification is a gracious work of God, whereby he, as a righteous judge, acquits the elect from guilt, that's the forgiveness, and punishment, and declares them to be heirs of eternal life because of the righteousness of Christ, the surety imputed to them by God and received by them through faith. So we talked about the definition of forgiveness. It is a remission of sins. But it's important for you to understand the, the place of forgiveness. It's inside the doctrine of justification. And if, if we were talking about justification, we would, we would even say more things about it. But let me return to forgiveness um, itself. Um, and and one, one more thing to show how much forgiveness is part of justification is sometimes it is used as a synonym. Um, in Romans 4, verse 6, Paul is speaking about um, justification. He's speaking about receiving this righteousness. But then he quotes Psalm 32, 1, and he says this. He says, Even as David also describes the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputes righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. That's Romans 4, 6. So you see, there's always those two things. And sometimes forgiveness itself can be thought of in, in, a, in a, you could say, a synonym in a general way about, about justification. But we always have to understand, it's not the whole thing. It's not just sins taken out. We need Christ's righteousness given to us. That's justification. You might remember... Almost two years ago, I think it was, we, we did look at forgiveness in light of all the many synonyms and figures and even analogies, or you could call metaphors, in the Bible. 
And, and it was astonished to find so many. And we singled out around 16. That, that's perhaps one of the easiest ways to understand what forgiveness is. And, and it says a lot about the heart of God. Why he does that? Because it's not every doctrine that has so many analogies, so many figures, but forgiveness does. And, and we find then these, and I'm just going to list them all, um, these, six, these, these 16, um, blotting out or erasing sin. See, it's a little different than carrying it away, but it's speaking of forgiveness. Little children or big ones, and we know what it means to make mistakes, and we make those calculations. Thankfully, it's in pencil whenever it is, and we take out the old eraser and we erase it. That's one of the figures that God uses for forgiveness. There is your sin written down in bold letters, but the blood of the Lord Jesus spiritually, graciously blots it out. When you find blot out my transgressions, it means erase my transgressions. Take them away from my record. And then there's the word remission. And remission is connected to someone in jail who will be remitted from, from whatever he had so many more years there. Um, pardon. Uh, the word acting graciously. One of the words written forgiveness in, in, in our own language really translated in a very literal form, simply means God acting graciously, kindly, generously. Um, purifying, purging, God not remembering our sins. Healing, as if healing from sickness, He heals us from our sins. Um, releasing from a debt, and that's the one that we're looking at today because of our verse. Carrying it away, um, removing it far away. The, the word removing is a little different. Because caring is you go and you take it and you set it and then you find places where the removing is more in a sense of even um, of, a, of a throwing it away. But then there's another way of throwing it away because you find verses that speak of throwing it very far away. And those are the verses that speak of throwing sin as far as the east is from the west or in the deep seas. And then the washing of sins, the covering of our sins, not imputing our sins to us, or even that God hides His face from our sins. Today we're only going to talk mainly about the releasing from a debt. Because this is how our verse has it. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That's, that's where we will focus, is, is in this figure of forgiveness. That forgiveness is the Lord looking at the list of all our sins. They are debts against us. We are, in essence, absolutely unable to make the payment. Because we need to understand this, that the debt that we have is that we, we were created to be God-glorifying creatures and beings who follow His law, and our debt is that we have not followed His law, and we have not served Him in a way that gives Him the glory that He deserves. You see, um, we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Well, this glory is infinite, and, and how can we attain to that? How can we glorify God as we were meant to glorify Him? And so that is our debt. See, our debt is, is infinite, and it is against an infinite being. And so it is an unpayable debt. It is an impossible to pay debt. We are debtors, and we need to be forgiven of our debts. And so all of these words help us understand forgiveness. And what, what I'm hoping to do, maybe not every single time, but as we approach future Lord's suppers, the preparatory sermon, we will hope to look at different words um, that define forgiveness and that give a figure of forgiveness to help us in preparation. And today we're, we're doing more of an introduction looking at forgiveness, but choosing the word debt since it is um, where it is in our text and we're, we're studying this prayer that the Lord taught us to pray. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now look at the beauty of this here. This is the God against whom we have this debt. 
And He sends His Son to the world and teaches us how to pray. And He teaches us to pray, forgive us of this debt. Notice the great encouragement here. The creditor is giving us a means by which the debt can be absolved. Not by which the debt can be paid by us. Yes, it must be paid, but it won't be us. We're the ones pleading that the debt would be released from our account. And in in the prayer, Jesus even included that little phrase. We're going to look at it as we forgive our debtors. We, We become people who are also in the position of creditors who will be absolving others of their debts. And notice the wisdom. If you want yours absolved, you better absolve the debts of others. It's all together in the same petition. Those who would look to the debts of others with bitterness, with with rancor, with vengeance, in essence are decreeing for themselves that God would not forgive your debts as well. Well, let's look at the basis of forgiveness now. What we'll leave, we'll come back to this very verse and the whole description of sin as a debt and forgiveness as canceling a debt in, in our last point, the importance of forgiveness. But now the basis of forgiveness. And what I mean by this is where does it come from? And it's amazing and precious. You, you look at this in light of God's Word where we take it all and we really find out that there, there are many causes where forgiveness comes from. It's, it's not just one but even as you look at these causes, they all have degrees. There is what we could call a very, a very initial cause. Some theologians call it the, the first cause. Like it starts here. And, and it's interesting that many things in life can be spoken of that way too. Um, imagine, boys and girls, a, a stone that hits a, a window and it breaks. But it's very rare that that stone does that on its own. Yes, it and it never does it on its own. It could be maybe a big storm that brings something and breaks it. But see, we're speaking of that storm and we're speaking of that stone. What broke the window was both the stone and the storm. But there was a first cause and there was a second one. And, and as we speak of this theologically, we can go as far back as God and say, of course, God sent the, the wind. The wind blew the rock. The rock hit the window. See, when people are involved in it, that becomes part of the cause as well. Um, Aristotle, he used the example of a sculptor. And and it really was how Greek philosophy thought and gave names to these causes. So the example Aristotle used was this, of, of a sculptor choosing a big piece of marble, stone, to be the beginning of the statue that he is envisioning to make. But now right there, imagine that statue will not happen without a stone. It will not happen without a sculptor. It will not happen without the tools. And you have to say it will not happen without the idea in the mind of the sculptor. Or else he would never go fetch one. And there's even one more cause they would speak of is the whole reason for that statue. Because that that reason had to do with why that sculptor is spending time on it. And so the names that they would give is um, the material cause, that's the stone, the formal cause, and that would be in the mind of the sculptor, the concept of making that statue. The final cause is, is that purpose, displaying it somewhere. See, that, that, that played a part, right? Someone said, can you go and do this statue? And, and that whole purpose is really what set the whole thing in motion. So that's one of the causes. That, that was called a, a final cause. And then we can speak of the efficient cause. And in this little example, it would be the, the sculptor himself um, doing the work. And then there's the instrumental cause, and those would be the tools. And some theologians have used those words because they, they, they really have a logic to them. And in terms of the first cause, 
And we could call it the efficient cause. And, and even we could put the word formal because what we're speaking of is the mind of God. It started there. That's where forgiveness began. Forgiveness began with God. See, in the mind of God, so it's a formal cause. And with the power of God, so it's an efficient cause. It starts there. No one can obtain forgiveness if it weren't for God. Forgiveness exists because of the nature of God. And, and, this is, and then we can single it out specifically. What about God? Well, the goodness of God. Look at Psalm 86, 5. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. See, it's the goodness of God. It's not just God. It's His goodness from which forgiveness comes. And we could also say God's grace. And the reason we say this is Remember I mentioned that one of the words for forgiveness, like in Luke 7.42, um, it says, And when they had nothing to pay, this is from that parable where, where that king forgives two people. One had sinned more, one had a greater debt, the other one had a lesser debt, but both are, are pardoned. And it says, And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. The word forgave them both is simply meaning he was gracious, kindly to them both. But then we understand this is, this is a debt, so the translators put forgave. So, but it's important for us to understand. See, the word forgive, what does it really mean? You don't see the word good there. You don't see the word grace there. But it comes from a Greek word that means to act graciously. Um, the, the Puritan Thomas Watson said, The first wheel that sets all the rest running in terms of forgiveness, in terms of justification, is the love and favor of God. As a king freely pardons a delinquent, justification is a mercy spun out of the bowels of free grace. God does not justify us because we are worthy, but by justifying us, makes us worthy. And so God's grace, that's where it all starts. And, and, and you can imagine, yeah, that's the mind of God. That's, that, that was in his heart. And it's an efficient cause because that's how it will happen. But then in terms of efficient cause, we still need to speak one more thing. And, <clears throat> and this, this is like an efficient cause in the very thought of what efficiency is in the sense of effect. Of you think of that man making that statue. See, that statue, those tools would be there and the rock would be there. Nothing would ever happen until the power was added to it and that, that, that artist comes. And the Lord Jesus Christ is this efficient cause who comes to the world and dies on the cross. See, His sacrifice is what makes what makes forgiveness possible. And when you think of the Lord Jesus, there's one more thing that we can attach to God in His mind. Yes, He's gracious, He's good, and that's why He sends Jesus. But why does He have to die? Why does He have to suffer? Well, because God is not just good and gracious, He's also just. And this is an important thing. See, God does not forgive you and me simply by closing His eyes to our sins or even sending them out into the cosmos. They don't just stay fluttering around forever. <clears throat> that would not have been just. And so for forgiveness to happen, justice had to be served. And that's why Jesus had to receive our sins and die and suffer the pain. Look what Brockle also says. He says, God does not justify as a merciful father by overlooking sin. Rather, as a righteous judge, he in the surety who had paid and done everything for them finds them to be free from all guilt and punishment and as having a title of salvation. So that's why Jesus had to come. And that's why he becomes this cause that, that is efficient in the sense of that's where the power comes from for you and me to be forgiven. And then, so we talk about God in His mind and the Lord Jesus, and God in His being, the Lord Jesus in His work. But amazingly, if you stop to think, there's a third cause. Now this cause, 
This is where it really helps us to look at our illustration. This is what we could call an instrumental cause. It's a cause that is never sufficient in itself. And it would never happen of itself. But the Bible still puts them as cause, and that's faith and repentance. Faith and repentance, even as you look through the theological books, faith and repentance are also causes for forgiveness because you will never be forgiven if you never repent and believe. Um, Thomas Watson put it very well, though God does not justify us for our repentance, yet not without it. See, it doesn't start with your repentance. This is why it's important to realize God in Christ, that's where the power resides. And yet, in God's wisdom, He chose faith and repentance to be like a chisel and a hammer. See, that is what connects us to the sacrifice of Jesus. And without Jesus, faith and repentance would mean nothing. And you cannot have faith and repentance without Jesus and God. But you cannot just stare at the cross and hope to be saved in an automatic sense. It will not happen. You must believe and you must repent. And this is where we find um, spelled out Romans 5.1, Therefore being justified by faith. And then Acts 3.19 where, where the apostle commands, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. See, if you do not repent, you will not have your sins erased. <clears throat> That's just not going to happen. And this is why it's important to understand these, these degrees of the causes. I'm not saying here that it starts with your faith and repentance, but Scripture puts faith and repentance in the position of a means of a cause. And connected to this, I don't think this is a fourth cause. I believe this is the outflow of faith and repentance. <clears throat> Jesus, when He teaches you and me to pray, forgive us our debts, He says, for us to also pray as we forgive our debtors. See, Jesus is literally saying, if you don't forget, you forgive your debtors, you will not be forgiven. Jesus wanted so much to make this point clear that this is the only point he explains of the prayer in Matthew 6. He says, for if ye forgive men their trespasses... Your heavenly Father will also forgive you. That's what I mean by a cause. If you forgive, that will be one of the means by which God will forgive you. And he puts it in the opposite. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. But again, we cannot look at this and think this is where it all resides. Some people do that and they run <clears throat> the error to think then that I'm the one who forgives myself. I forgive others and I get forgiveness and it starts with me. No, this is why we started um, with God and Jesus. And we understand these are instruments. And notice, this is why Thomas Watson said it, it will not happen. Forgiveness will not happen without repentance. It doesn't happen because of your repentance as if it starts there. But it will not happen without it. And this is what Jesus is saying. And, and, and this is how we can understand it. Because if you are a soul who can never forgive, and if somebody comes to you and says, Brother, look what you're reading here. It says if you don't forgive, you're not going to be forgiven. And that person says, I don't care. You don't understand. The sin against me was so great, I cannot do it. See, that's revealing a heart that does not know the Lord Jesus, who has not been forgiven. And that's, in essence, why he cannot forgive. He doesn't understand. And that's, in essence, what Jesus is saying. You need to be certain that you're a believer. If you refuse forgiveness, it will be refused to you. And, of course, for a true Christian, when we read this, it has been, hasn't it, a great source of encouragement to your heart and mind to realize, I, I need to forgive. How can I not forgive? Because I need to be forgiven. Lord, help me to have a heart of forgiveness. And it ministers in, in a sanctifying way to the heart of the believer. Because even true believers have a hard time forgiving. It's not easy for, for all of us the moment that you become a new 
a new creature. It's still hard. It's hard on our nature. It's hard in our pride. And we need to die to our pride. We need to die to our ego. We need to remember what Jesus did to us. And then out of his ministration, out of his strength, we're able to forgive others. But see, forgiving, we would put that in the category of instrumental cause. It's, it's the outflow of faith and repentance. If you have true faith and repentance, you will have obedience. And forgiving others is obedience. And so this, this is what I mean by the basis. And let me go to our third and last point, the importance of forgiveness. And what I mean to do here is, is just bring some applications to, to conclude everything. We've, we've already seen that forgiveness is so connected to justification. Justification, the first part of it is forgiveness. And I just want to put this very clearly. Without forgiveness you also have no justification. This this is the final desire to be declared righteous by God. You will never be declared righteous if you don't have first your sins cleansed and forgiven. We need this or we die. And the second application is, it's going back to this figure that sin is a debt. See, we we have broken God's law. We were created for God's glory. Um, We were created for that purpose. But spiritually, we are in debt because we're not fulfilling it. We're not not keeping God's law. We, We have His image, but we're not living as image bearers should live. And and that's our debt. And it's it's an unpayable debt. And, and And I want to turn your hearts and minds to that parable that the Lord Jesus told. And I'll bring it more as an illustration, remember, of of that king who is looking at a servant who had an astronomically great debt. And Jesus is showing the heart of forgiveness through this king because that man pleads that he may be able to still pay. And that king chooses to absolve him of his debt. That is showing the heart of forgiveness from God. And that man goes out free, forgiven, no more debt. But remember, he meets another servant of that king and someone who, whom he had owed money. And he grabs him by the neck and says, pay me my debt. So Already there, you realize the dissonance. This man does not know how to pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. He goes out and he makes that man pay and throws him in prison even though he pleased, and even though the debt was drastically minimal. It was payable. Whereas the debt of the first servant was unpayable. You could live the rest of your life, you could never pay it by the values. Well, the king catches word and brings that servant back. And he is severely admonished. And see, this is the parable of all that we're talking about. We owe a tremendously enormous debt to God. If we were to pay it on our own, it would literally mean condemnation forever. There is no day in hell that this payment is fulfilled. It starts with death and goes on with condemnation, eternal death. Graciously, God sent His Son, the Lord Jesus, to receive hell on the cross and eternal punishment on his moments on the cross and die. See, he pays the debt. And you and I are called to believe. I have to trust that that death is that powerful, that the sacrifice of Jesus is that efficient. That is what you and I are called to do, believe, and to repent of our sins. We're to look at our sins and realize it is a debt, and I don't want to keep it. I don't want to keep adding to my debt. I want to live a life that is debt-free, spiritually, repentance and faith, and you receive this forgiveness. And, And see, when you put it all together, 
the blessed proof that you've received it becomes the fact that you see other people because we live in a world where transgressions are going in every direction. We sin against others and every sin is against God. And yes, people sin against you and when they sin against you, they are sinning against God. And they need God's forgiveness. This forgiveness is, is divine. It is what cleanses. It is what pardons. When, when we forgive others, it's nothing atoning. We're not relieving them of their death from God, we're, we're just saying between me and you, I will never bring it again to accuse you. My heart will not be bitter against you. I have a heart of love, of grace, of generosity to you. And the Lord Jesus is saying, in essence, that will be the proof that you've been forgiven too. If you're able to do that. Forgiveness of debts do you realize you're a debtor? Have you confessed your debts to the Lord? Have you repented of them? And have you forgiven the debts others have against you? There's always that eternal question, how do I forgive if they haven't confessed or if they haven't repented? The, the principle is simple. Your heart must be one that shows forth this very heart of God. Because our forgiveness of others is not going to absolve them in any way. But we can tell them, whether you understand your sin or not, I want you to understand my heart is full of love. My heart is full of grace. But as long as you don't even acknowledge it, of course it will always be there. We can't have a normal relationship. But just know that from my heart... I have a heart full of forgiveness. I hope you seek it from God. And you can talk to me anytime you want. That's the attitude we should show to those who sin against us. Because that's the attitude that Jesus shows to us. I just want to end with this thought. No one had asked forgiveness yet. The centurion had not yet repented. His disciples were still far and many had still forsaken Jesus. But as they were hammering the nails and as they were chanting the cheers, Jesus said, forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus isn't saying, Father, as soon as they know what they did and as soon as they call out to thee for help, then forgive them. And he's already with a forgiving heart. And we understand the whole theology of cleansing will happen when God wants it. But we have to have this heart. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. What does that mean? Be pleased for the sake of Christ's blood. See, that's the instrument, that's the efficient cause. Not to impute to us poor sinners our transgressions nor that depravity which always cleaves to us. This is the confession. It's the repentance. It's the faith. It's the instrumental cause. Even as we feel this evidence of thy grace in us, that, that it is of our firm resolution from the heart to forgive our neighbor. And if you don't have that heart, you will not be forgiven. And that's the heart that follows repentance and faith. I pray that you and I may be ready for next Lord's Day to partake of the Lord's Supper, praying this very prayer and trusting that in Christ the debt has been paid in full, all for His glory. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious and glorious God Almighty, we thank Thee, O Lord, for having sent Thy Son to cancel our insurmountable debt Lord, we confess that we don't always and never acknowledge this debt to the extent that we should. Thy word, Lord, is so full of comfort and so full of mercy and grace. Help us, Lord, not to take that for granted, but that we would truly live lives, Lord, that are repentant and that are full of faith, trusting in Thy work, trusting in Thy Son, Trusting in these causes, Lord, that are unalterable. 
The Lord Jesus' death can never be less than what it was, even though my faith and repentance can. And we pray, O Lord, that we would be strengthened in the thought that once we are justified, um, it it is finished. There is never an unjustifying act. And no matter who we are, whether the greatest of saints or the Christian with the least amount of faith, it is the same amount of justification that we receive so that it humbles all of us no matter who we are and it encourages us if we are the least of these. Help us, Lord, to be humble and to acknowledge that that Thou art a gracious, holy, loving God and forgive us, Lord, our debts as we forgive